Hello, James. I just invited you to the stage. Would you be able, have you accepted the invitation? Hello everybody and welcome to our first ENT event. Um, we're going to give it a few minutes before we start just to allow more people to join. So congratulations for being early. Hey Gabriella, it's James. Hello. Let me know when um, there's enough people around and we'll, I'll get started. Yeah, there's about 12 people on so far. I'll give it a couple of minutes to just after 7 p.m. I imagine we'll probably get a few stragglers after that, but it's just to allow everybody possible to join. Not a bother. Just to check, are you able to share your slides onto the screen? If not, I've got access to the slides and I can put them up as well. I'm pretty sure um, I could share them on here. Yeah, looks Great. to be working. Also, just to say, if there's anybody that you know of who wants to come to this talk but can't come uh, live, we will have recordings posted on both YouTube and Medal um, for future reference. So, yeah, you can share it with your friends. It's fine.
So I'll just give a brief introduction and then James, if you want to start afterwards, go for it. Um, so hi and welcome everybody who's joined so far. Um, I'm hosting or helping to host this event on behalf of Mind the Bleep, um, which I'm sure you guys are all familiar with, um, which is basically an organization dedicated to trying to help foundation doctors and medical students kind of get through and uh, know how best to prepare. Uh, we've got tips on pretty much every specialty that you can think of, as well as general stuff about how to be an F1, portfolios, ARCPs, things like that. Um, and we're always open to people joining us and we're always open to people wanting to do things. So if you're interested, give us feel free to send us an email. Um, this was set up to basically give an introduction uh, to people who are doing a foundation job in ENT. Uh, but it's open to anybody interested. Um, so again, feel free to share with your friends and stuff if you know that they're keen. Um, but yeah, it's open to everybody and should hopefully provide a really good overview. Um, so we've got, I think, six talks lined up for you so far, uh, trying to basically cover every area of ENT that would be most valuable to a foundation doctor, um, trying to give it to you in kind of a condensed hour long slot um yeah to help keep people engaged um if you've got any questions at all we've got a live chat as well so feel free to uh put post your questions in there i'll be checking it throughout um and again yeah if you have anything to add if you've got any feedback we also have a feedback section and it's also a good way to get your certificates to add to your portfolio to get your teaching hours up so yeah uh, again, thank you everybody for joining us so far, and yeah, I'll let James take it away. Thanks very much, Gabriella. Um, on a personal note, yeah, Mind the Bleep is great. Um, it certainly got me through a lot of um, situations in F1 and F2. Um, a lot of the stuff they publish is very useful when you're starting out. Um, hi everyone, I'm... Um, James, I've been um, uh, an ENT clinical fellow at Manchester Royal Infirmary for the last two years now. Um, and uh, before that, I did an ENT job in F2 uh, a few years ago. Um, and the point of this talk isn't to give you sort of an exhaustive list of everything that you should possibly know about ENT, um, because it's pretty hard to do in an hour. It's just to cover some basic uh, common presentations and where your mind should be going in terms of treatment and any red flags to look at, out for. Um, so without further ado, um, if you've got any questions as we go, pop them in the chat box, um, would be the easiest way to go about it or just leave them to the end and I'm at the end. Hopefully you can all see um, the screen. Um, I'm sure Gabriella will tell me if you can't see it at any point or if we're having any issues. Um, as I said, uh, we're going to be going through just a couple of case scenarios, what the likely diagnosis would be, and then what some red flags are to look out for in ears, noses and throats, really. Um, so first one, a very common ENT thing, somebody comes in with a with otalgia, a painful ear. This particular instance, you have an 82 year old male who's had left sided ear pain for the last four weeks. Um, he's seen his GP a couple of times during that period, and he's given some oral antibiotics for a presumed ear infection of some kind. Um, GP thinks it's a titus externa, um, so an infection of the ear canal, but it's not getting any better. In fact, his, his pain um, is generally getting worse. Um, he feels a bit run down in himself, um, but he doesn't have any obvious systemic symptoms, just this pounding, painful ear that's been going on for a month now. Um, a bit of background about him and himself. For a man in his 80s, he's, he's pretty well. He's, uh, um, he's only on one drug really, he's only on metformin for um, his type two diabetes. Um, over the past month, he's noticed now and again, some nasty gunk come out of his ear, as you can see in that photo. Um, 
he ha doesn't really know what this is all about and he, it hasn't bothered him as much as the pain has. Um, more recently though, the pain has got to a point where when he's, a, he's asleep at night, he can't lie on that side of his face. It hurts too much. Um, and uh, he's, he's getting headaches alongside just his ear pain as well. So everything's just gradually deteriorating for this poor chap. Um, so first thing you're going to do is if you're referred this or if this person comes into A&E or into clinic, um, this is quite a common thing for people to walk in as a walk-in centre or an A&E thing, or maybe they're just on, on an inpatient ward under a different specialty and it's referred as, you know, something dodgy with an ear. Um, this is what a normal otoscopy should look like. Um, so because we need to establish what a normal one is before we can clarify what is abnormal. So normal findings on otoscopy, you should be able to see the tympanic membrane. There shouldn't be any debris or gunk in the way. If there's a bit of wax in the way, that's fine. A little bit of wax is normal. Um, but as long as you can see some part of the tympanic membrane, it should be flat, it should be reflective and shiny. Um, it shouldn't have any holes in it. And the procedure of just looking in the ear itself shouldn't be a painful one. If they say, ow, there's probably something going wrong. But this picture here is perfectly representative of a normal one. Um, it's, it looks like stretched cling film is the best way to describe it. That is a normal eardrum. Um, some other options that you may come across in ears. Uh, if um, you look in the canal walls itself, are reddened and stenosed and it's full of sort of cottage cheese nastiness. Um, this is pretty uh, typical of an otitis externa, otherwise known as swimmer's ear. So an infection of the canal itself. It will hurt. There will be occasional discharge coming out of it at times. Um, they tend to settle by themselves in the sort of seven to 10 days in most people. If they don't, or if they're particularly painful, then the treatment is topical antibiotics. Um, for most of these slides, I've put the treatment in blue at the bottom. Um, so oral antibiotics doesn't really do anything at all for otitis externa, um, but topical drop treatment, and it depends on local guidelines wherever you're gonna work, but um, most places, ciprofloxacin or gentamicin drops for seven to 10 days tends to do the job. Um, at the time, you can also take a swab and send it off to see what the sensitivities are. But I'd still start them on one of those two drop regimes, and hopefully that will clear up pretty commonly. Um, this kind of ear infection is far more common in adults than it is in kids. Um, the other major type of ear infection um, is an otitis media, which is an infection of the middle ear, so behind the eardrum. Um, you get a red bulging eardrum, as you can see in this picture, which sometimes um, you can see sort of a yellowy hue behind it, which is a buildup of sort of purulent discharge waiting to pop and come out. Um, this is far more common in kids than it is in adults because their eustachian tubes are a lot smaller and infection can get up them from the nasopharynx far more readily. Um, and it almost always comes after some sort of upper respiratory tract infection. Um, so otitis externa, adults, discharge, red painful canal, otitis media, usually kids, the canal is fine, but the eardrum is bulgy and red. Both are going to be sore, but the, the soreness in otitis media tends to be more of a deep-seated pain and it feels like pressure on the inside of the head. Um, the treatment for this would be more often than not to do nothing, they tend to resolve. Um, either they just go away or the eardrum perforates, the pressure comes out, and then the symptoms are largely resolved. But now you've got a perforated eardrum, which takes a few weeks to heal up. Um, so of those two options, it's probably a titus externa, because he's got discharge coming out of his ear. He's an older guy. OE is far more common in adults um, compared to OM. So you give him some topical antibiotic drops, as I've discussed. Um, however, he's been taking them for uh, a week and his, his symptoms are only getting worse. Um, he now comes back to you or returns back up to GP or a &E or wherever with a good going facial nerve palsy. Uh, he's got a raging temperature and the pain is now a full blown 10 out of 10. 
Um, you do some bloods and his inflammatory markers are pretty high. Um, so something has taken a turn for the worse in this chat. Um, I should say that this is uncommon. Usually, you know, it, it's straightforward, ear infection, give drops goes away. But if you ever see a picture like this, it should be ringing alarm bells as to what I'm about to reveal in a minute. But if you've got signs that are causing a cranial nerve palsy secondary to an infection, we tend to have a fairly low threshold to get a CT. At this point, you'd, li you'd likely be discussing with one of your seniors anyway, um, but the end result is probably going to be a CT. And what that CT is going to show is, so if we start on the normal side of his head first, he's got a nice normal patent ear canal on this side. It's black, it's full of air, um, as it should be. And his mastoid bone on that side is, again, aerated as it should be. On the other side, he doesn't have a nice air-filled ear canal. It is full of gunk, it is swollen, and it's denosed. Um, there has been destruction of some aspect of his temporal bone. There is a little gap there where the arrow is pointing to where there shouldn't be a gap. And his mastoid, instead of being aerated, is full of stuff. What has happened in this instance is the infection has spread from just being contained within his ear canal to the surrounding bone. It has munched its way through and he's now got osteomyelitis of his temporal bone, which we call necrotizing otitis externa. It is relatively rare on the grand scheme of things. But if you're going to have, if you're going to look out for anything when it comes to ear infections and ear pain, this is the thing that you need to have at the back of your head. Um, it's uh, it's almost always due to a pseudomonas infection. Um, and I don't think I've ever seen a patient have it who hasn't been severely immunopressed slash very old slash diabetic, usually all three. Um, so if you see an elderly patient who's diabetic, who has ear pain that's not going away and is very severe, you've got to think, right, has this spread to the bone? Um, the treatment for this will be usually sort of a couple of months of IV antibiotics and occasionally surgical debridement of the bone if necessary. Um, if left untreated, um, it can erode through into the cranial cavity and uh, you can get meningitis, encephalitis, brain abscesses, seizures and death. Um, early on in the, in the scheme of necrotizing otitis externa, it's quite common to get a cranial nerve palsy because of the, the level of inflammation and pressure around both the external and the middle ear, the facial nerve is quite commonly compressed, giving you a palsy. Um, it needs to be recognised semi-early. Um, earlier the better, really. Most, as I said, most ear infections are not necrotizing otitis externa, even if they're painful. But if they're resistant to treatment, if they've already had a course of antibiotic drops and it's done nothing, if the pain is way out of character, by which I mean you know, a normal ear infection shouldn't be keeping you up at night. It should be annoying. It shouldn't be absolutely, you know, poundingly painful. If they're immunocompromised or elderly, and if the, if it's going on for a prolonged time frame, you've got to think, isn't necrotizing OE? Do we need to get a scan? Okay. Worst comes to the worst, you get a scan, and it's not that, but at least you've ruled it out at that point, and you can start IV therapy as needed. Um, so... Quick recap on is most infections are fine. If it's a tightus externa, drops will go away. If it's a tightus media, tend to leave it and it will go away. But uh, necrotizing OE needs to be taken quite seriously. Um, the second case, um, so we've got a 24-year-old male, female even, um, who's had a few weeks of purulent nasal discharge with a nasty sort of headache right at the front of her head and general cold-like symptoms. Um, just from that alone, um, we're going to think, right, has this normal upper respiratory tract infection, whatever it started out as, has it spread into a sinuses? Um, all of the paranasal sinuses of the face 
you know, drain into the nose. So any infection that can that can exist within the upper respiratory tract can work its way into the sinuses um, if you're unlucky enough. Some people are more prone for it to get into their sinuses than others just because of anatomical variations of how wide their sinus openings are. Um, and if it does, and I'm sure a couple of people listening now have had sinusitis, I've heard it's far from pleasant, um, you will get the classic symptoms of a bad frontal headache, tenderness over your forehead or over your cheeks, hurts more if you lean forward, really sort of sore to sneeze, and out of your nose will be coming greeny, yellowy, nasty discharge. Um, it tends to settle after seven to 10 days. You just feel miserable for that time period, um, but it does go away after copious amounts of over-the-counter analgesia and a bit of bed rest. Um, so this, what she's presented with sounds like pretty classic sinusitis, um, but she's feeling pretty unwell with it. So we want to take a slightly closer look. Um, you'd initially have a quick look up the nose um, to see if it was really inflamed and red and loads of gunk coming out. Um, you could, if you were feeling fancy, do a fiber optic nasendoscope, um, which if you're due to work in ENT in the coming weeks or months, um, you'll be taught how to, to scope patients pretty early on. It's quite a fundamental skill in the ENT. Um, and, but that's sort of where the camera would be pointing. You, you put that at the nose, have a good look at the turbinates to see what was going on. What a normal inside of a nose is going to look like is something like this. You're going to have various ridges as you go up the nose, you know, coming off the, the, the septum. Those those ridgy planes are the turbinates. They should be there should be a fair amount of gap between them as there are in that picture, and there shouldn't be much in the way of any gunk. A little bit of mucus is not as fine, but it's not completely rampant in that photo. Whereas this one. The, the turbinates are really swollen, um, sort of touching each other. There's not a lot of room for manoeuvre around. And there's all this nasty, yellowy, purulent discharge dripping off everywhere. So this is pretty classic of sinusitis. Most of the time, seven to 10 days, they feel a bit rubbish, but it goes away. If it doesn't, we can give, um, if and if, Occasionally, they can be slightly systemically unwell with it. They can have a mild fever, perhaps. Um, you can give some oral antibiotics, uh, but the best thing for it is going to be nasal treatment. So direct nasal treatment in the form of decongestion and steroid sprays and drops, just to really open up the nose to allow all the gunk to come out um, alongside sort of nasal douching. So sort of salt water um, douching up the nose to, again, clean everything out, wash everything away and to allow the the sinuses and the nose to just heal a bit. However, she's had all of this. She's had some antibiotics. She's had good going nasal treatment. She comes back afterwards and she's not looking brilliant. Again, don't, I know all of these uh, scenarios are like, the worst case scenarios. So don't think ENT is all, you know, scary. Most sinusitis is 99% will respond to this treatment. 99% of hepatitis externas won't turn into necrotizing hepatitis externas. But the point of this talk is to just give you a little bit of context of when you should and shouldn't be worried. Um, so she comes back into clinic and she's looking somewhat like this. She has a red, puffy, proptosed, chemosed eye, um, which wasn't there before at all. The eye is very sore. It hurts to move it. Um, she may even be saying that it, the vision out of that side is a little bit blurry. Um, she, the, the eyelid itself may be completely swollen over and she can't open her eyelid at all. The only way she can do it is by prising it open with her fingers. Um, this is pretty bad. Um, and if there's any hint that you know, there's compromise to vision or you can't see the eye because the amount of swelling before it, um, you're going to have a low threshold to get a CT to see what's going on behind the eye. So we get a CT. Um, 
the, the, as I said, the threshold to get a CT, if the eye is very painful, they can't move it or you can't see the eye. What this CT shows is um, a significantly prop toes left eye compared to the right. Uh, you can see it's bulging out to a pretty significant degree there. Um, within the uh, ethmoid and sphenal sinuses, um, it should be black. Your sinuses should be full of air and air on a CT comes up as black as it does on the contralateral side of the CT. But this is full of material. You, it will be inflamed muco mucosa plus nasty uh, infective mucus. But if it isn't black, it means it's almost certainly a sinusitis within that sinus. Alongside that, we've got this dome-like protrusion from the edge of the sphenoid sinus. And that is a formation of a, a subperiosteal abscess as a result of this really nasty uh, sinusitis. It is eroded through the, the paper thin um, sinus bone into the retroorbital space and, a, uh, and uh, an abscess is now sat there. And this abscess is pushing everything forward. So that's why the eye is being pushed forward and it is straining the optic nerve. The optic nerve doesn't like to be strained so that's why her eye um, is having some blurry vision. And if that strained optic nerve is strained for too long, um, she may well have permanent sight loss on that side. If we look at it from another angle, from head on, um, again, you can see this protrusion of this, this, this bulging abscess that's coming off the sinus. And we can see the sinuses are, again, not black as they should be on the other side they're full of gunk and on this side we get a view of the maxillary sinus as well which is also full of gunk so the sinusitis is fairly well spread it's in well at least three out of the four sinuses we've not got a view of the frontal sinus but the sphenoid ethmoidal and maxillary are all full of rubbish um she's that her face is going to be very sore but more importantly than that her eyesight and uh, the, the health of her eyes at imminent risk what this demonstrates is a periorbital cellulitis. Most periorbital cellulitis starts out life as sinusitis. Not all, but most. Um, if it gets a little out of hand, the, the infection within the sinus can spread to the tissues around the eye and threaten the eye health. Um, it can result in an abscess. Sometimes it's just inflammation of the tissues. There's not a discrete abscess. Um, but if that strain upon the optic nerve is there for too long, um, it, it can be irretrievable like sight loss. Um, there are different types of sinusitis, as I alluded to. Um, it can, uh, if, if, the, if the infection around the eye just involves the eyelid itself, then the eye isn't really at threat because you're not putting any strain on the optic nerve that can be treated with antibiotics. And if the tissues behind the eye are infected and inflamed, but there's no discrete abscess to drain, then you can't operatively manage it. You just have to give them IV antibiotics and closely monitor the eye and hope for the best. If there is an abscess on the CT, then that's when uh, surgical management will get involved. And these kind of surgeries are done as part of ENT. Um, ophthalmology won't do this because the eye, the globe of the eye itself isn't requiring any operative management. It's all of the tissues around it. And the way that you can, they'll access those tissues is through the nose endoscopically, hence it being an ENT procedure. Um, if left long enough, uh, it can track backwards and form a, a cavernous sinus thrombosis. Um, and then the patient can become profoundly septic, unwell, have strokes, and the mortality rate is quite high. Obviously not, not what you want to happen. Um, in terms of noses, I'd say sort of the two main things that you get called to that go wrong with them are maybe some sort of sinusitis. As I said, 90% of them are self-limiting. If they're really bad or they've been dragging on a bit too long, you can give nasal treatment in the form of drops or decongestion or steroid sprays. But if it's starting in any way to affect the eye health, so 
their eye hurts or their eyelids are swollen or their vision is in any way compromised or they can't move their eyes they once could have done then you need to get a ct pronto to see if or to see what's going on behind the eye because that sinusitis may have spread the other main thing that goes wrong with um, noses is um, epistaxis. I'm not going to talk about that in this talk because there's an entire another talk in the series dedicated to epistaxis because it will be, you know, a major feature of your on calls and your ward work. If you're working in ENT, you get called to a lot of it. Um, um, and I'd recommend, you know, attending that talk because you'll learn a lot of useful practical uh, procedural skills and how to manage epistaxis. But um, as far as I'm concerned, just sinusitis, fine. If it's affecting the eyes, not fine at all. Um, right, now we come on to the throats. Most of ENT, um, in terms of the workload in an emergency department, the workload in clinics, and the workload from ward referrals um, are throat-based not so much ears as a nose. Um, the reason for that is because um, you can become far more unwell far more quickly from a throat issue, obviously, because you, you can compromise your airway compared to any ear or any nose problem. So let's talk about throats. Um, this chap, we've got a 16-year-old uh, a male with a four-day history of um, a sore throat and a painful swallow. For the last day, he can't even tolerate water. It, it hurts that much to swallow. He's systemically not feeling brilliant. His voice is a bit muffled and croaky now, and it hurts to fully open his mouth. However, he's breathing okay. The saturation is 99%, he's breathing fine. Um, the, the most common type of sore throat uh, um, at least in adults, that presents in this sort of fashion is going to be tonsillitis. Um, tonsillitis by far and away skews towards younger people. So teenagers, people in the 20s, people in the 30s, by the time you get to 40s, 50s, 60s, it should drop off. If you see someone with really big, good going tonsillitis and they're in there, I'd say my cough tends to be about 40. Um, it might just be tonsillitis, but there is a higher likelihood that that tonsillitis is there because of an underlying process. It may be because they're immunosuppressed for whatever reason. It may be because they have some sinister malignant process going on elsewhere in their throat that's causing their tonsils to get repeatedly infected. Um, so anybody over the age of 40, 45 ish that comes in with good going tonsillitis, you should, you know, think about a little bit as to what's going on and may require slightly more thought and investigation. But anybody sort of, you know, teenagers, 20s, 30s, that tent, that's sort of par for the course. You look in the throat and you see two big juicy tonsils. Um, in this instance, they've got a nice big balls of pussy exudate on them. And the uvulas in the midline, it's going to hurt a fair amount but they'll be breathing fine um the, their swallow might be somewhat impaired i'm sure a fair amount of you in the audience have had tonsillitis i know as a teenager i had it an awful lot i haven't had it since i was maybe 17 or 18. it tends to be one of those things that at a certain age you just grow out of it um if they can swallow tablets and they're systemically not too unwell they can go home with oral antibiotics usually these people present to the gp and it is a primary care issue. Um, however, if they can't, you know, get a GP appointment for whatever reason, um, and you know, it, it, we all know that it is difficult um, at the time of writing to get a GP appointment um, at some, in some parts of the country. Um, but and a lot of them end up turning up to an urgent treatment centre or to A and E instead um, because it. You know, if they really can't swallow anything, then fair enough. But if if they can just about get a tablet down them and they're systemically not horrifically septic, then oral antibiotics for five to 10 days should sort them right out. If they cannot swallow at all, or if they're really quite unwell, then they may need to come in for maybe just 
a day or so for some uh, treatment to really knock it on the head. The best way to knock it on the head fairly quickly is uh, a shot of IV dexamethasone to get the swelling down. And as soon as the swelling's down, they can drink and get pain relief and get antibiotics in and they feel an awful lot better in themselves. Um, give them an IV uh, course of uh, benzyl penicillin and um, crucially fluids as well. These patients are almost always fairly dehydrated because they've not been able to drink properly for the last however many days. You give them a big old bag of fluids, they feel better almost immediately. Um, a lot of the time, if they turn up to A&E, after a shot of Dex and a bag of fluids, they look like a different person and they're more than happy to go home with a course of oral antibiotics. But occasionally, if they haven't quite you know, turned around yet, then you can admit them for continued treatment. But that would be my advice with tonsillitis. The other thing that it may be is a Quincy. Um, a Quincy um, is not just severe tonsillitis. They are two succinct conditions. Um, Quincy's will always start out as tonsillitis and then an abscess will form in the soft tissues anterior to one of the tonsils. Um, they appear and present similar to tonsillitis, but just slightly worse in most regards, really. So whereas some tonsillitis is have a really difficult swallow, but can actually swallow a bit. A lot of Quincy's can't swallow at all. Some of them come in with a bucket or some tissues and they're just spitting into them because they can't even tolerate their own saliva. They have uh, quite profound vocal changes. This classic hot potato voice sounds like they've, they've burnt their tongue on something. Um, they have trismus. Uh, trismus is a painful opening of the jaw so that they're only able to open their jaw a couple of centimetres and they're more likely to be a, a little bit more systemically unwell than just a tonsillitis. Um, and the picture, it's not the best picture of a Quincy, but it does illustrate the point. It is a one-sided swelling that's pushing everything over. So the uvula is no longer in the midline. It's been shifted off to the patient's left in this instance. And there is this erythematous bulge where the arrow is pointing to. Behind that bulge is a probably an infected tonsil. That's not the issue at hand at the moment. It is the bulge itself is a big ball of pus. That needs to be aspirated. Um, once that's aspirated, then they've reverted from a Quincy back into a normal tonsillitis again, and you can treat them as a normal tonsillitis as I described on the previous slide. But that big collection of pus needs, uh, needs to be aspirated. The way to do that is to numb the area with a, a, a local anaesthetic spray and to stab it with a needle and try and draw some pus out. Um, it is a commonly um, performed procedure within uh, ENT and you'll be doing a lot as a, as a junior in ENT in the emergency department. I would strongly advise you to watch someone do one first and, and be taught how to do them because although it is an easy enough procedure, it can go wrong if you don't know what you're doing. If you if you drift a bit too much laterally and you go too deep with your needle, you're not going to be a million miles away from their internal carotid, which is the last thing you want to be shoving a needle in. So the key is, is to essentially where that tip of the arrow is, that's where you want to be stabbing. And you're never going to hit carotid then. And the needle should only really be going in about a centimetre max. Once you've popped it in, you draw back on the syringe um, and hopefully you get a big load of pus out. Once you've done that, the patient feels usually a lot better very quickly um, because this swelling that's been taking up a huge amount of space in their throat's gone. They can, they, they're still going to have sort of tonsillitis behind this Quincy, so they're still not going to be back to normal completely, but they'll very much thank you. Well, after they've maybe sworn at you a bit for shoving a needle at the back of their throat because the lidocaine spray can only do so much. But once they've got over that, um, they bounce back pretty quickly. If you ever see a, a Quincy and you're happy in draining one, I'd recommend draining it sooner rather than later because those things only tend to grow and the patients only tend to get more uncomfortable as they go. And then there's sort of two outcomes. One, you stab it and aspirate it. The second one, 
um, if you leave it long enough, they tend to pop. And that is really unpleasant for the patient because they just end up with a mouthful of pus and blood in the middle of the night or whenever they're least expecting it. So it's easier to just go in and aspirate it sort of cleanly with a needle um, after numbing it first. Um, anyway, so back to the patient at hand, who I'll remind you is a 16 year old with a few day history of a really sore throat. You look in his throat and his throat looks absolutely fine. There is no evidence of tonsillitis on, or quinsy in this throat. The uvula is in the midline. His tonsils are you know, not inflamed in the situs. We can see them uh, on the left and right of the picture there. They are just existing um, with no erythema to them, no pus, but he still has an extremely sore throat. Um, only after he sat in the department for a little bit do you notice his breathing has started to sound a bit strange. Um, and now, whereas before he could swallow, but it was difficult, now he can't swallow at all. Um, and also, um, this is more of a paediatric sign than a thing that you see in teenagers, but I thought I'd mention it anyway, in case any of you cover PZ and T. Um, he's, he may be sort of leaning forward and tilting his head back slightly in order to get more breath sounds in. You know, in order to get more breath in, sorry. Um, these are all fundamentally um, very worrying signs and should be ringing alarm bells, especially in the context of a normal examination of the throat. Um, what you'd see if you looked in this chap's throat with a fiber optic nasendoscope um, is, well, I'll show you in a second, but it, this is what you'd, a normal view of a fiber optic nasendoscope. So you stick a camera into the nose, down in through the nasopharynx, into the oropharynx, and you're now looking in, at the larynx itself. This is a nice, thin, pale epiglottis at the bottom. It should look vaguely like a Pringle, okay? Importantly, you can see beyond it. You can see the vocal cords that lie just beyond it, and beyond them, you can see trachea. The vocal cords are nice and open, which means, you know, they can get good air flow in and out. And when they talk, those vocal cords should open and shut accordingly. This is a completely normal, lovely view of a larynx. If you were to scope somebody with epiglottitis, you would see this. You would see a very red, swollen, sore looking epiglottis that looks a bit like an angry jelly bean compared to the nice Pringle looking shape on the left. You can't see the vocal cords anymore because the epiglottis is so swollen that it's in the way. And um, it is very bad. In the acute setting, I would not scope um, a person who I thought had epiglottitis. I would just treat them and then scope them when they're stable. I'm just showing you this here for illustrative purposes. Um, because if somebody has an impending airway issue, the last thing you want to do is waste time, you know, looking into their airway. You just want to treat them first and then look afterwards. Um, but if you're suspecting epiglottitis, which this kid is ticking all the boxes for, you know, he's young, he's got an extremely sore throat, his breathing is sounding a little bit off, um, he's unable to swallow anything, and yet the back of his throat looks absolutely fine, um, then... It, you, you need to act sooner rather than later um, because it's a sort of an impending airway disaster epiglottitis. They present with the worst sore throats in the world, really. Their voice may be completely gone. If they can talk, it will be very hoarse and very croaky and they will be systemically very unwell. If they are stridulous, by which I mean they have strider, um, that is a late sign of epiglottitis and shows that the degree to which the epiglottis is obstructing the airway is quite severe. Um, if you've never heard strider, um, it sounds sort of like <gasps> that. Um, it is an obvious sign. You can't have a subtle strider. Um, you will walk into you know, the room in A&E or recess or wherever they are, and you'll hear it before anything else. It's loud. Um, uh, it sounds very distressing and the patients are distressed with it. Um, it's very different to a wheeze, whereas a wheeze can be subtle, a strider can never be subtle. A wheeze is a lower airway problem, a strider is an upper airway problem. 
So I've just got a clarifying question. Oh, yeah. Um, respiratory distress. So would a patient like this commonly present in respiratory distress? Yes. Um, their respiratory rate would be significantly raised. Um, they may well have low SATs um, and they won't be able to fully complete sentences um, without having to <gasps> sort of do that between every word or any other every other word. So they, they tick all the boxes for sort of classical respiratory distress, even though their lungs are fine, but sort of the gateway to their lungs, which is their, their epiglottis and their larynx, is far from fine. But yeah, they'll be tachypneic and potentially desaturating. Um, if you see something like this, um, then, it, well, it's not just going to be your problem. You need people around. Um, it's more than appropriate if you see someone like this and they're on a ward and there's no one else around to put out a crash. That's absolutely fine. Um, any anaesthetist would be fully on board with attending a crash like this. Um, that's very much within their wheelhouse. If you see a patient like this in A&E, you don't want to be handling it by yourself unless you're very, very sort of confident in doing it and you've managed lots of epiglottitis previously. Um, the people who you want there are, if you're just working in A&E, you want a senior A&E person with you, you'll want to make a call to anaesthetics and you'll want to make a call to a, a ENT. Whilst they're on their way though, there are some things that you can do in the meantime to, to help, um, but do not delay calling. Um, the initial steps are, well, you're gonna do an A to E, you will get to A and then immediately realize that you've got an airway problem. So B, C, D and E already don't really factor into it because A needs fixing first. Um, how are you gonna fix A? We need to get this epiglottis um, to shrink as quickly as we can to maximize the airflow that's going down in the trachea. The way to do that is with high dose IV steroids. Um, dexamethasone tends to be the steroid of choice and adrenaline uh, given through a nebulizer works a treat. If you drive adrenaline through a neb, it's, it directly targets the back of the throat and the laryngeal structures the adrenaline will sit on that epiglottis, cause profound vasoconstriction and shrink it. Um, you can, it, it can shrink drastically, very quickly. Um, the nail by mouth point is somewhat redundant because they will have made their sem themselves nail by mouth because their swallow hurts too much. Um, you'll want to give them oxygen um, because they're already finding it hard to breathe. Even if they're saturating at 99%, they're probably working really hard in order to maintain sats of 99%. So whenever they're not having a NEB, make sure they've got high flow, potentially humidified oxygen and give them some fluid as well because they're gonna be systemically septic. Those are all very important things to do, but you want to have in the back of your mind the knowledge that there is someone on their way to help that's someone being ENT slash anaesthetics, probably both. Um, but if you call me and say, what should I do? The, the first two things I'm probably going to tell you to do are give some steroids and give some adrenaline nebs. Those are the two things that will have the greatest chance of, of saving this airway the quickest. Obviously, they need antibiotics as well. But Antibiotics aren't going to fix your airway in the next five or 10 minutes, but the DEX and the adrenaline may well do. Um, and just, they can never have too many adrenaline nerves either. Just keep giving them back to back until senior support arrives. When senior support arrives, um, a couple of things may happen. They may say, congratulations, you've saved them. Um, through your decks and your adrenaline nebs and everything else. The epiglottis is shrunk to a degree that they're no longer stridulous, they're breathing okay, will continue medical management, happy days. The anaesthetist may say, I'm not happy with this airway and intubate them there and there to uh, you know, maintain a safe airway. If um, anaesthetics aren't able to because the epiglottis is too swollen, um, that's when an emergency tracky may well put in.
that's why you also want ENT there alongside anesthetics to chuck a trachea in if necessary. Um, that won't be up to you. That won't be your call as an ENT F2 or whatever. Um, that will be one of your seniors call, but just know that's why you want them there because that may be the direction of travel. Most epiglottitises do not end up with a trachea. Most epiglottitis epiglottitis don't end up being tubed either in my experience most are managed okay with just the medical treatment of the adrenaline the decks the antibiotics etc but the crucial thing is is the recognition of that and you starting it sooner rather than later and then these decisions can be made um, afterwards um, so some take-home messages about all of that whirlwind tour of ENT. Most ear infections aren't that serious, but if they start to affect the cranial nerves or the patient's had it for a really long time and is immunocompromised, you've got to have in the back of your mind, is this necrotizing hepatitis externa? And if so, have a chat to a senior about it and have a low threshold to getting a CT. Again, that probably comprises less than 1% of hepatitis externas but it's something that you, you will come across now and again. Um, most nasal slash sinus infections will go away by themselves with maybe some assistance of some sprays, or some drops, but any periorbital slash orbital involvement, then the eye's at risk and it needs to be taken way more seriously and it's time to escalate. And um, any, any hint of strider, call anesthetics and ENT, um, pretty much before you do anything else. Um, and treatment wise, adrenaline nebs and IV decks has got me out of more sticky situations than you could believe. It's not just epiglottitis. If they've got a massive laryngeal cancer that they've presented to A&E with really late because they haven't been, you know, they've been scared to go to their GP or to hospital for the last two years because of COVID. Um, and they come in stridulous with you know, a cancer the size of an orange sat in their throat. If you give them dex and adrenaline nebs, that cancer will transiently shrink and it may buy some time with the airway. Um, even with trauma, if they've been, I've seen it before, someone got kicked in the neck at, at a rugby or a football match and they had really profound internal bruising around their larynx, uh, which is a really odd presentation. And again, adrenaline nebs and IV decks just shrunk it down for a, a, enough time for their airway to be safe and for senior to support to arrive for us to make a decision about what to do. There's never, you're never going to be chastised for giving adrenaline nebs and IV decks if you're worried about an airway. It, you know, sometimes you'll give it and it doesn't, it wasn't needed, but I'd rather you give it unnecessarily than, than under give it to someone that does definitely need it. Um, I know a lot of those things I talked about, they all ended up in sort of the worst case scenario. I'm sorry about that. Most of the NTs, fine. Um, but these are the things that you should just have at the back of your mind. Um, thanks all for listening. And I will, if you've got any questions, feel free to shout them out or I'll look at the chat box. Got one saying, how do you differentiate an acute epiglottitis from anaphylaxis? Um, good question. Um, epiglottitis will always have the path of, um, it will initially present as just a sore throat. It's never going to suddenly become a massively grossly edematous um, epiglottis they will have a sore throat they'll feel a bit systemically unwell and then gradually they're th swallowing and their breathing will get worse and they'll be systemically septic whereas an anaphylaxis there tends to be you know i ate a prawn and i ate a peanut and then my lips felt tingly and now they're puffy and my tongue's puffy and i can't breathe properly um so you know in the absence of a fever or any infective signs you're going to veer towards more anaphylaxis and if things started out sounding like an infection with a sore throat you're going to think more epiglottitis however if you are really stuck then again iv dex and nebulized adrenaline will help with both um 
and if you're if you you can give uh, IM adrenaline as well if you want because that's more of a, a, a the first line of anaphylaxis. But again, if you're worried about the airway, I can't recommend enough Dex and adrenaline if you're really stuck. But they do pre present in in different ways. Um, can you brief us about vertigo, please? Oh my gosh, vertigo. Um, I think there is a talk later in the series about balance issues and all sorts of otological things. Um, so I'll largely leave that to them. Because, um, yeah, vertigo in itself is a minefield. Um, there are... All, I, all I'd say on vertigo is be sure to separate out the... There's two main causes of vertigo. Either there is something wrong with your semicircular canals or it's centrally there's something wrong with the processing of your uh, balance orientation within your brain. That one is far more worrying and could in indicate a stroke. If it's something to do with your cochlea and your semicircular canals, it's far less worrying. Um, so those you need to rule if it's a stroke in or out at an early stage. But I'll leave that to the other talk. Um, how do you prescribe nebulized adrenaline? I can't find a recommendation on nebulized dosing the BNF. So um, you give, it's, it's adrenaline comes in different strengths. Um, you want to give one in a thousand as opposed to one in 10,000. So one in a thousand adrenaline. Um, you want to give a five millimeter vial of it um, nebulized. That's it. You just crack open a five mil vial of, ne of, of one in a thousand adrenaline, tip it into a nebulizer, put it on the face. That's how to give nebulized adrenaline. Excellent. Thank you. Do you have any more questions, anybody? Speak now. Just having a quick look. No, there's no more questions. Um, but plenty of thank yous and a thank you from me too from for agreeing to give up your time and giving such a really great informative talk. I particularly enjoyed you using the scans. Um that was really, really useful. Thank you. And right. yeah. Yeah, I hope um, you all enjoyed it. If you've got any other questions, um, I don't know, you can probably email me or access me somehow. And my, my details are on the UK, the ENT UK uh, representative website. Anyway, uh, you can find my email on there. Out um, of interest, um, where about, are you uh, a rep for this year as well? For oh no, I'm, I'm I'm I think I'm up now. My rep time's up, but I think my details are still on there because they haven't found new reps yet. But I've been a rep for the last twelve months. Excellent. Um, um do you want to tell uh, our viewers just a little bit about being an SFO rep and a little bit about SFO? Just because I I recently became an SFO rep, and I think it would be really yeah. useful for the guys here to know, especially if they're interested in ENT as a career. Sure. So SFO, which stands for Students and Foundation Doctors uh, in Otolaryngology, um, is the um, a branch of ENT UK, which is the National ENT Organisation, um, which promotes ENT as a career to students and to people starting out. Um, and the, the role of the rep is to educate a bit about ENT, um, to provide um, a bit of um, knowledge about how to get into training, any tips and tricks about audits and presentations and things like that. Um, and it's a good place to start if you're thinking about going into it is to just emailing your local rep. Um, a lot of the, um, that there are, around the country, there are reps at different levels. Some medical schools have their own rep. And then there, there tends to be a foundation rep and a core trainee rep. Um, I'm the core trainee rep for the Northwest. Um, I think there might be another one or two of us, but in each part of the country, there's a few. Um, they're all, everybody who's a rep has, has had to jump through those hoops um, at some point and are the best people to talk to about how to tick those boxes, how to jump through those hoops. And if you've just got any general questions about ENT, or if you, you know, work for, a, if, if you're a member of a uni society that is to do with surgery or is to do with ENT, they're the people to get into contact with about delivering a talk. Um, I've done them for, it doesn't even need to be your local rep. I've, I've done talks for, for some reason, Scottish 
loads of Scottish ENT societies. I don't know why. I, maybe I'm listed down as a Scottish ENT rep because my surname is McGregor. But um, there, I've you know I know a few of the other reps. They're all very nice, and they're a good port of call for sort of career advice and any ENT advice. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, and just to say for the feedback link, I've posted it in the chat. Um, hopefully, you should all get a feedback link as well when you signed up. But if not, feel free to message on the Facebook group. Uh, when you fill in the feedback form, you should get a certificate for attending this event. Um, and we're really keen to hear your feedback because we want to know how to make these events best for you and also, yeah, the most applicable as well. Um, so yeah, feel free to give the feedback. And again, thank you so much, James, for giving up your time to do this talk. It's quite right. It's been a pleasure. Um, good luck, everyone, in your future careers. and. Um, if you want to do ENT, um, good choice. It's quite a fun one. It's a very welcoming specialty as well. Yeah. yeah it's one of the friendlier ones. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm going to end the talk now. But again, if you've got any questions, feedback, message us on Facebook or fill in the feedback form. But yeah, thank you very much all for attending as well and giving up your evenings to come along. So thank you and bye-bye.